Position yourself. <coughs> is it is it uh, coming over there? This one side on the board. Yeah. Let's see this okay. So it's up online. Is your is your voice on? Uh there. Oh, my volume? Yeah. Huh? Okay, it's working. Yeah. Out. So I don't wanna. Um. Yeah, you probably wanna mute it, so you don't get uh, right, feedback. Feedback. Stuff. Let me just do a full screen to see how it is. Okay, looks good. Oh, it's a uh, programming team dot cc dot cartic dot edu. Yeah. Programming team dot cc dot cartic dot edu. Slash high school slash jack dot html. Yeah. So I'll just leave that up. I can probably leave that up the whole time. Yeah. <coughs> so we can probably start. Let me say a few introductory words. We are already online. Oh, okay. So hello everybody. Um, so this is Kyle. So Kyle's going to be uh, presenting today's uh, uh, lecture. It's going to be on data structures using Java. And uh, next, starting next week, uh, we'll we'll start inviting you guys on site to uh, the Georgia Tech campus, and I'll email you guys the the details on how to get here, what room to come to, and stuff like that. So yeah, um, Kyle. Yeah. Hey everyone. So today I'm going to go over some basic uh, data structures, and all, all my examples will be in Java. That's what we prefer to use. Uh, it's very easy to use, and it has nice error, message, um, error messages on like some languages. So the first topic I'm going to go over are arrays. I'll be here for like a few minutes, and then I'll be here. So an array is basically just something that holds some objects and a chunk of memory. So you have an array and you can put stuff in it. And each of these little boxes is like an index. So this would be index 0, 3, 4, and 5. So the way you create an array in Java is like this. So first, we want to say we need to tell Java what the array is going to hold. So here we're going to hold integers, and the keyword for that is just int. And then you need to give it um, a name. And then you actually instantiate the array. So this is going to create an array of size 8 and initially it will be filled with 0 because that's the default value for integers in Java. That's not true for all programming languages though so be careful if you're using something else. Okay so the thing with arrays is that, that once you've declared them you can't increase their length they're always this array is always going to be size 8 
if I wanted to make array larger, I would have to, or r larger, I would have to create an entirely new array. So this can cause problems if you don't know exactly how many things you're going to be adding to the array. Okay. In order to index an array, like get something at an index or add something to a particular index, you just use the brackets again. So if I wanted to make um, array at index 0 equal to 4, it would look like this. So here I'm indexing the array at 0 and using the assignment operator I'm setting it equal to 4. So that's all I'm doing right here. And then I'll show another example. So here I'm setting the array at index 5 equal to 8. You can do basic math operations in here as long as it evaluates to an integer. Um, you can do anything you want in here as long as it's an integer. Okay. Uh, same thing over here. This could be a method called pretty pretty generic. So if you want to access something in an array, you do the same thing. You just do these square brackets, and you can access it. So that's pretty much all there is to arrays, uh, to just simple one-dimensional arrays. So there's another thing you can do in Java. Um, and you can make two-dimensional arrays, which are much more useful. So the way you go about doing that is you just add some more square brackets. So here I've created a two-dimensional array that's 8 by 8. So it's going to look something like this. You can imagine it looks like this, except there's eight cells rather than four. Okay, So that's sort of what you can picture it to look like. So you can see that this would be useful for maybe um, simulating like some sort of game, like tic-tac-toe or chess. So I, I'll do a quick example using chess. So I have this array, and I'll just call it the board. So this is going to be our chess board. It's a two-dimensional array of integers. And so now, to, now we could imagine that each different integer represents a different piece. So maybe 0 is an empty tile. right? And then 1 could be a black pawn. One could be a black pawn, two could be a black knight, etc. You could just come up with some integer that represents each piece, and then you could fill out this board appropriately, and then write a few methods to update it, and then you could simulate a game of chess like that using this two-dimensional array. So that's just one example. There are many other examples. Um, and then, of course, here you would also need some way of keeping track of which player's turn it is if you're actually simulating the game of chess. So this isn't re restricted to just two dimensions in Java. In Java, you can have as many dimensions as you want. So for example, I could do this. And then this is now a three-dimensional array. And then I'd have to instantiate it over here if I actually wanted to use it. Or I could do a four-dimensional array. So these aren't as common as one, one and two-dimensional arrays, but they are possible. And sometimes they come up with more difficult and more difficult problems. And one other thing I want to mention is arrays aren't restricted to just the primitives. For example, I could have an, uh, an array of strings. It's not just integers, longs, booleans, all those. So I could do something like string. Um, and so now this is a 2D array of strings. 
So that's pretty much all there is to arrays. And let's see if you have any questions. No. Okay, so the next topic I'm gonna to talk about are linked lists, which is another sort of structure. So linked list. Basically what a linked list is, is it's a collection of nodes and they're going to keep track of what's in front of them. So you can imagine that each of these is a node and it's pointing to what element is next in the list. So for a structure like this, you're gonna have to have a head pointer. Something that tells you exact where to start, where to start looking. And then that's all you keep. You just keep a reference to the head. And then maybe this is 4, uh, 10, 20. So your list is 4, 10, 20. And so when you want to get something, you start at the head and you ask for, like for example, if we wanted to uh, get the second index, remember it's zero index, so this is zero, one, and two. If we wanted to get the second index, it's going to start at the head, and then it'll ask for what its next, its next node is, and then it'll ask 10 what its next node is, and then you'll get to 20, right? And so that will be what's returned from getting the second index. Okay. So that's just low level sort of how it works, and then there are different kinds of links list, linked lists. You can have doubly linked lists. And then frequently, this is the most common way, you'll have a tail pointer also. And this speeds up certain types of operations that are very useful, which I will get to in a minute. Okay. So I'll give you just a really basic node class. So public class node. So all, all that the node class is, is it's going to have some data. It's going to have some data and then a reference to whatever is next in the linked list. So whatever's next is also going to be a node. It's going to be pointing to another node and we'll just call it next. And then you'll have your constructor and getters and setters and whatever other stuff you might need. But this is pretty much all that the node class is. Okay, so it's not it's not too complicated. So what's nice about Java is that it already has most of these fundamental structures already built in for you. So you don't actually have to worry about creating this node class and coding them. You can just use what Java has already programmed. So the, the class is called a linked list. So in Java, how you would instantiate that is linked list. And here, Java supports generic arguments. So what's in these angle brackets that come right after the uh, class is basically what's going to be in your linked list. So here I'm saying I want to create a linked list of integers, a linked list of integers. And I'll just call it L or LL equals new linked list integer. And so that's how I would create a linked list in Java. So now linked list has all sorts of methods. Like if I wanted to add an integer to it, I could do ll.add40. Then I could do ll.add20. And so if I executed these two lines, what I'm going to have is basically 40 
and then after that I'm going to have a 20. So this is what my linked list looks like right now. And now there are also some other methods like you can remove from a linked list. So linked list.remove and it, does, it doesn't have to take any parameters in and this will just remove whatever the first element is. You can look, you can look all this up in the Java API and the Java doc. If you just search for Java linked list on Google, a whole list of all the methods and what they do will come up. So if I did ll.remove, it's basically just going to remove this node. Okay. So these are very useful for simulating things like queues, which I will get to in just a minute. And they have quick, um, they can very quickly remove from the remove the from the very front and very end of the list. Unlike arrays, where if you try to remove from the front, you have to shift elements back and forth to keep it uh, nice. So I'll I'll go over a comparison between arrays and linked lists now. So arrays versus linked lists. So some important operations might be um, so the operation and then for an array and a linked list. So an important operation that happen that you need to use a lot is adding or removing to the from the front or end of the list. So add slash remove from the front. Okay. So for an array, you can imagine you have this chunk of code or chunk of memory, and you already have some elements in here. It doesn't really matter what they are. We'll leave that one empty. So now we want to add two to the front of this array. The problem is there is nothing right here. We can't make this array larger to accommodate the two. So we're going to have to shift this over. So each of these elements would have to shift over. So the five is going to move down here. Four will move down here. The three gets shifted over. And then we can add the two right here. So as you can see, we had to look at each element, even though we just wanted to add one thing to the front. So in running time wise, that's linear versus constant. So this is, if you're familiar with big O notation, this is O of n, which means you could potentially have to look at all n elements that are in your array. Now with a linked list, let's say we had the same list. We have 3 pointing to 4 pointing to 5. And we have some reference to this as our head. Now when we want to add the 2, all we have to do is create a new two node and then change our head pointer. So we didn't have to worry about anything after this. We just tacked the two onto the front. So this is called constant time. So it's much faster than having to shift all the elements over. So this is O of one. So that, that's very quick. You can't do better than O of 1. So that's uh, one way that a linked list is better than an array. Okay. So another common operation is when you have to add or remove from the back of the list. So add, remove back. 
So you can imagine, so for the array this time, let's say we have three, four, five. Now if we want to add six, all we have to do is just go here and add the six. Okay? We don't have to we don't have to shift anything because we're adding it to, to the end this time. So for this, it's going to be O of 1 because there's no shifting involved. Okay? And then you can imagine the same argument with the head and tail as long as you have a tail pointer. For a length list, it's also going to be O of 1. So these are both constant times. So there's no real benefit to using a length list or an array for this specific case. And the reason why it's O of 1 to get here is because we can directly access any index in an array. Because it's one chunk of memory, the just accessing an index, they can calculate the offset and find directly where it should be. Okay. So another common operation, it, like I was just mentioning, is indexing. So getting something at a particular index. With an array, it's one solid chunk of memory. So you can calculate exactly where, say, the third element in an array is supposed to be, because you know how large those chunks are in each index. So you can access it directly. Now, you don't actually have to calculate it. Java will do that for you. You just have to put the square brackets on there and tell Java which index you want. For a linked list, on the other hand, Let's say you had the three, four, five, and then maybe a six. You have to start here. Let's say we were looking for five, or the second index. You start here, and then you have to, you start here, then you have to move to the four, then you have to move to the five. And that's when you would stop. So you, you can see that for a linked list, indexing could potentially be O of n because you might have to look at every single element or half of the elements or some, it'll be on the order of n. So here when you need to index something arrays are much better. Okay, So just from this little chart you can see when all you need to do is add or remove from the front of your list, uh, a linked list is better, right? Because it has O of 1 for both of these. However, if you need to index something very frequently and get, get items in the middle of your list, you're going to want to use an array because it has O of 1 lookup time rather than O of n, which is much better. Okay, so that's a basic comparison of linked lists and arrays. So like I mentioned earlier, Java has this whole collections class built in. So Java has array lists and linked lists that you can use and, and add elements to them. So an array list an array list is basically just an array, but it's in a nice uh, class that Java has created that will resize when appropriate. So you don't have to worry about indexing something. Um, you don't have to worry about not having enough room to add an element. You, Java will automatically increase the size of your array for you. And the way it does that is it has to create an entirely new array so it can be slow. It's not quick to create a new array, but it will handle that for you, which is really nice. So, and just like with the linked list, you're going to have to tell Java what you want your array list to hold. So in this case, we're going to just create an array list of integers. I'll just call it an array list. Equals new array list. So now we have an array list of integers. And so you can imagine this just being an array. And it has methods like 
add get remove and this might take in an index they, they, they'll, they'll all take in an index or not an index if you just search for Java array list on Google it will give you all the methods that it has and it will describe each of them exactly what they do so this if you like I said earlier if you need to index something you should use an array list because the get method will be O of 1. So that's the important thing to know about array lists versus linked lists. Okay. And so I've been I've been using these uh, angle brackets and they're called generic uh, generic types. So this just lets me lets me decide what my list is going to hold. And so it can be any object. So I could make my list of string objects, right? So here my array list would be containing strings rather than integers. I could also change this to some any other object. Maybe I have a node object, or sorry, a student object. And this might be an object that I created. It doesn't have to be one of Java's built-in objects. It will hold any type of object you have appropriately. So that, that's basically what generic parameters or types are. So it's just when a class is generic, you just put the angle brackets, the object here, and then the object again before the constructor. The important thing to know is that you can't use primitives. So. For example, if you wanted an array list of integers, you can't do int. This is bad. You have to use the actual object. So each primitive has its own wrapper class, which is basically just the whole word spelled out and capitalized that you can use. And it's exactly the same, except this is an object rather than a primitive. So just make sure you're not using primitives when you do this or your code won't compile. And make sure that what's in these angle brackets match up. If you're using Java 7, you don't have to worry about that, but some of you might not be using Java 7. Okay, so that's pretty much all there is to linked list and array list. So one application of uh, lists is maybe you want to sort some data. Maybe you have some data that you want sorted. So there's a comparable interface that you can make a class implement. And this will allow you to give some ordering to your data. So I'll, I'm going to create a class. I'm going to create that student class. So public class student. Okay. So I'm creating this class, and now I want to say that it is comparable. So the way I do that is I implement the comparable interface. So implements comparable student. And so this basically says that this student object is comparable with other student objects. So when we implement an interface, we have to make sure that our class that we're creating has all of the methods that our interface requires. So the comparable interface requires exactly one method. It requires the compare to method. So the signature is um, just public and compare to and then it'll take in a student object. 
So, sorry, so let's imagine our student has some integer ID. So this is like your student ID, and this is just a field that's in the student class. So that's what we'll use to compare students. So a student with an ID of like one, two, three, four, five is going to be considered less than a student with an idea of like five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we're just basically sorting the student objects based on their ID. So what the compare to method does, just a quick overview, it's going to return an integer. So you're comparing two objects. This, so this, this isn't code, this is just something real quick. This object dot compare to that object, so some other object. So what's going to happen is the compare to method, there are three different cases. If this is less than that, we're going to return a negative number. So, so we're going to return a negative number. If this is equal to that, we're going to return 0. And if this is greater than that, we're going to return one, or a positive number. And so that's the basic contract of what compare to is supposed to do. So these are the three cases. So it's you can you can see how you do that in code. That's pretty easy with three just an if else if else statement. So let's do that real quick. So if um, so, this is going. This is a keyword, and it's going to refer to the current object that we're in. So the current object that this method was called on. It's not necessary if it's not ambiguous, but I just want to be clear. If this dot id is less than s dot id, so here this is less than that. So what we're going to do is return a negative number. So it doesn't matter what negative number we return. So I'll just return negative 1. Else, if this that ID is exactly equal to the other student ID, then I need to, sorry, this needs to be an else if statement. If this dot id if this is this id is exactly equal to that id then we're going to return 0 because they're equal and then our last case because we know it's not less than and we know it's not equal we automatically know that we're in the greater than case so i don't need to check any conditions again and i can just return 1 positive integer. And that signifies that this ID is greater than S's ID. Okay, So that's the basic compare to method that will sort the student objects. Now, remember that I said it just has to return a negative number. It's not necessarily negative 1 or 1. 0 is always fixed, but these two can change. So I could make this negative 3, for example, and it's still obeying the contract of the compare to comparable interface. I can make this 1,000. That's still OK. So what we're going to do is um, this allows us to make things easier. OK? what we can do instead of having to have this if else if else block we can just subtract them so in one line return this dot id 
minus s dot id. So what's this going to do? So you can see if they're equal, this is going to be equal to zero, obviously, right? And then if this ID is larger, so maybe this is 20, and then the student, the that object is 10, 20 minus 10 equals 10, so it's a positive number. So it's going to correctly return a positive number when this this side is larger than this side, and then when this is less than it, it will obviously return a negative number because you're subtracting off something larger. So that changed our whole if, else, if block into this one line of code. So that's why the contract is to just return a negative number and a positive number rather than negative one, zero, and one. So it, it makes our lives easier. Okay. So now why is this compare to method important? What benefit does it have? it gives us a way to order all our elements. If there's this compare to method, and assuming it's not some random method, you can sort your, uh, you can sort whatever list or whatever sort of data you have, and you can put it into a nice order. So let's, how, do we, how, do, how would we do that in Java? So let's go back to Let's say an array list. So array list. Sorry. And this time it's going to be an array list of student objects. Okay. And so let's finish off of this. And then you can imagine we added some student objects. Just imagine that it's a full list of students. Maybe it's all of the students at your school or something. So now we want to sort them by their ID number. Because remember, we just had that class up, and it had an ID. And it was comparable based on that ID. So all we have to do in Java, they already have some really nice sorting algorithms implemented. So there's the collections class which is a super class of array list, linked list, and all sorts of other fun things. So we can do collections dot sort um, and then we just pass in the actual array list object. So I called it AL. So I just pass in this object and because it contains comparable data, it will use that compare to method that we wrote, and it will sort this in ascending order. So this sorts in ascending order. And so that means it would be like 0, 1, 2, 5, 8, 8, 10. Like that, that's a perfectly valid list, assuming these are like student IDs or something. Okay. So collections.sort is very powerful. Remember, with linked lists, indexing is very slow. So this sort is going to have to use indices and swap around a lot of things. So if you tried to sort a linked list, it would be much slower than trying to sort an array list. So if you need to sort, you almost always want to use an array list if you're going to use this built-in sorting method. Okay. And now, now what if instead of sorting in ascending order, we wanted to sort in descending order? Because this is always going to um, sort in ascending order. How it, that's just how it's set up. So we would actually have to change the compare to uh, method of our student object. But what if we don't want to do that? What if we just want this one list to be in descending order and all of our other lists to be in ascending order? So you, there's still something you can do. You can create this comparator object. So these sort methods, they take in another parameter. So this is, in Java, this is called method overloading. Um, I think that's what it's called. Doesn't really matter what the terminology is, but it allows the same method name with different parameters. So we're going to 
we're going to create a new comparator object. And we're just going to create an inline. We're not going to. This is an interface. And so we're going to create an anonymous in our class. So new comparator student. So the comparator object has one method that's required. It's similar to compare to, but now it's just called compare. So public int compare. Its return type is, it follows the same contract. So this is going to take in two objects, two student objects. So student this. I can't, I can't put the I there because it's a keyword. So I just abbreviate THS and student that. And just to be the same, I'll abbreviate that as well. So this compare method is going to return a negative integer if this is less than that, zero if they're equal, and uh, or if we consider them equal, less than or greater than, it'll be the same contract. But here we want them in reverse sorted order. So one little hack that we can do is say that students with larger numbers are considered to be less than students with smaller numbers. So all that we'd have to do is write this compare method and return, notice here we're using that this time, id minus this dot id. So we swapped these two and now this will let us This will let us sort in descending order rather than ascending order. And so this comparator is very useful because sometimes you, it's not just a student class. You can make this for any class. For example, you could make array lists comparable, which they aren't inherently comparable. So, and you don't want to go change an array list. Maybe you want to sort the array list based on the first element. This allows you to do that without having to go make the array list class implement the compare the comparable interface. So it's a very nice thing to know how to do. So that's pretty much what comparable is. And that's pretty much all there is about sorting. OK. So I mentioned this earlier. I was talking about queues and how linked lists are very good at implementing queues. So let's go over what a queue is. A queue is what it sounds like. If you if you get in a line, sometimes you call that a queue. A queue at a roller coaster, theme park, or something. That's all it is. And when you're in line, the first person in is the first person out. So it's first in, first out. That's what PIFO stands for. So that's the abbreviation that's commonly used to describe a queue. So you can imagine this is a queue, and maybe this is the front of it. Some little person might walk in, and so they're going to be at the front of the queue. And then some more people are going to walk in. And then this person is going to go get on the roller coaster. So he's going to leave. So the first person in your queue is the one that leaves. And then, so now he's the new front. And then he gets on the roller coaster and he leaves. Now he's the new front and he leaves. So now our front's changed after we've removed these first three. So now our front's here. And all these people have already left our queue. 
So now maybe some more people walk in. And then this person gets on the roller coaster, or this person, and now he's the new front. So you can see it's just the first person in is the first person out. And that's pretty much all there is to a queue. And this is very a very useful structure. It's used all the time in graph searching algorithms, such as breadth first search, abbreviated BFS. Um, you will be getting into stuff like that uh, later on in these courses, I believe, or lectures. So it's a very nice structure to know how it works. So the methods it have it has are NQ and NQ and DQ. Yeah. And so this is basically your add to the back method. And then DQ, like we said, we, the first person in the line is the one that gets to go on the roller coaster next. So DQ is remove from front. Okay, so if you remember back to that chart I drew up with comparing linked lists and array lists, you can see that this is much better to be implemented as a linked list because you only have to access the you only have to access the front and back. And for linked list, that's both both of those operations are constant time. Versus an array, where if we had an array, our DQ method would be O of N because you have to deal with the shifting. There are ways to get around that, but I'm not going to get into that with an array. So these are the two methods for Q. And it's first done, first up. It's pretty basic stuff. So okay, so there's another structure that's similar to a Q, or that's commonly associated with a Q, I guess called a stack. Where is this? So stacks are last in, first out. So what that means, the last thing that's put into the stack is going to be the first thing that's taken off the stack. So this is, this is like a stack of trays at a uh, Maybe you have some trays at some restaurant. You're not going to want to take this bottom tray and move it off. You're going to want to take the, tr the next tray off the top of your stack. That's why it's called a stack. Or you can imagine a, sta a stack of pancakes. You're not going to eat the bottom pancake before you eat the top one, usually. Um, okay, So that's what a stack is, last in, first out. So this. Yeah, that's all it is. It has methods push and pop. So this is like add to the back, and this is like remove from the back. Right? Because everything with a stack deals with adding and removing to the back. So you can see here we're only dealing with the back. And if you look, if you remember that chart that I drew on the board, an array has O of one time for both of these operations. So there isn't a benefit of using a linked list versus a an array in this case. Both of them will behave well because you're only dealing with the back, and arrays can handle that. So let's see. So this is also used in graph searching quite frequently, and this is for DFS, depth first search, which is very similar to breadth first search, you just change the data structure from a queue to a stack. You will also get into that later. So now I'm sure if you have been programming in Java before, you've gotten a null pointer exception or some sort of exception and a bunch of red text is printed out to the console. So. What that is, is Java printing out the stack trace. So the stack trace 
is basically the stack of methods that has been called. It uses a stack. So if you have some, let's say you have some method A. So here's our Java virtual machine, and this is our stack. This is actually what Java uses. So let's say method A calls method B. So somewhere in this method, maybe we call B with the value 4. So when A calls B, it's just going to put B on top of the stack. And so then when B, maybe in B, we call this other method C. So then C gets put on top of the stack because before B can complete, C has to complete because B is using some result from C. So that's why Java uses a stack. So then when C is done, B can finish, and then A can finish. If, for example, there was an exception in this method, that's when you get your stack trace printed out, and then where these methods were called and their line numbers are printed out onto the console, and that's where the red text come from, comes from. It's the stack trace being printed out. So this is something Java does automatically for you. That's just one application of a stack. Um, yeah. So that's what that is. OK. So let's see. Our next, our next topic is going to be about trees. OK. So a tree is, you can imagine your family tree where you have some figure at the top, has some children, maybe this guy has three children, so it only has one, two, it's just some tree. That, that's all, that's pretty much all a tree is. It's a node, and each node can have some children, and each, each node has exactly one parent. You can't have more than one parent, but you can have more than one child, and, sorry, I'm saying all these terms. So. If this is your node, then this is the parent, just like in your family tree. You can imagine this. And then these are all your children. So this is a child, this is a child, and this is a child. Okay? So you have your parent, your node, your children. Okay, so. The important part about trees is that there are no loops. So this is no longer a valid tree. You don't want anything like that. The tree has to be, can't have any cycles. If you have cycles in it, it just becomes a graph. And we will get in, and that's a useful structure, but we will get into that later. Trees have their own little purpose. So there's a specific type of tree called a binary tree. And a binary tree, what's special about that, you can imagine from the word binary, is each node has at most two children. It can't have more than two children. The two is the limit. So this is like the left and right child of this node. This is left and right child of this node. This is left and right child of the root node. Okay, so that's all there is to a binary tree. It's just a tree where you have at most two children. Okay, so right now it's not very useful. So there are some restrictions we can apply to it. We can call, we can make this a binary search tree. So a binary search tree. What this means is that there are there's some ordering in this data. So if we call this n and this left and this right, then we have to maintain this invariant where left is less than n and n is left than right less than right so everything to the right of a node is larger than it and everything to the left of a node is less than it 
And so this allows us to split up our data and find things quickly. So I'll draw an example of a binary search tree. So we can just put 50 in our root node, and the root is just the very top of the tree, basically. So 50, 25, 75, and here, now we need to come up with a number that is both larger than 50 and less than 75. So 60 will work. And then here, just 100, and maybe here. This one would have to be larger than 50, larger than 75, and less than 100. So 90. Okay, maybe over here, put 30, then 29, 31, maybe we'll put negative 7 over here. Then maybe we'll put 10. Sure. So this is a valid binary search tree because the property that left, less than, and less than, right, is maintained throughout this tree for every single node, right? 10 is larger than negative 7, 25 is less than 50, 75 is larger than 50, 60 is less than 75, etc. That property right here, this invariant, is maintained throughout the tree structure. So you can imagine now if we want to say check to see if our tree has, I don't know, 30, let's just see if it has the number 30 in it. So we're going to get 30, or let's just say it contains, contains 30. So we want to check if our tree contains the number 30. Now if we were using a linked list, remember, we have to look through each element. We have to look through every single element, and it's O of n time, we, because we might have to look at each one. 30 might be at the very end, or 2 before the very end, but you're still going to have to look at potentially every single one. With a binary tree, however, as long as it has this nice structure and is sort of balanced, then when we we can compare this 30 to the 50 and say, okay, 30 is less than 50. So now we don't have to consider uh, any of this. We can ignore all this stuff. So all this stuff, just ignore. Right? Because we know that 30, if it's in the tree, can't be larger, it can't be on this side because it's not larger than 50. Right? And so now, now we sort of, so we were at 50, and now we're sort of at 25. Now we're at 25. And we're going to compare 30 to 25. So when we do that, we're going to see that 30 is larger than 25. So we're going to want to move to the right. So that lets us ignore all of this. Ignore. And so now you can see here that we're cutting off approximately half of the data, as long as the tree is shaped nicely, we're cutting off half of the data each time we move down a level in the tree. So it's going to be much quicker to see if 30 is in the tree. Here we only had to look at one, two, three elements and we found it, rather than having to look at all however many 10, 11 elements I guess are in this tree. We only had to look at two or three rather. So the running time of this is going to be much better than that of a linked list or an array list because there is some ordering in, within the data. So it's very nice. And Java is awesome so it already has a tree structure implemented, implemented for you. So the class it's not necessarily a binary search tree, but it is a search tree of some sort. The class is called a tree set. So, tree, sorry, tree 
So it's tree set, and like all of the Java classes, it's generic, so we need to tell it what we're going to put in it. So I'll just use, I'll use some doubles this time. So I'll just call it tree equals new tree set. So here, I'm just creating a new tree set, and the set just means that duplicates are not allowed in this particular tree, um, which usually is not a problem. So this is going to have a tree-like structure, so all of the operations are going to be uh, on the order of login rather than order n like a linked list was. Okay. So there are some useful methods in the tree in this tree set class. Um, I, it, you can do like last and first. I, I, I believe they're called that. I'm not positive. You can look, you can just Google tree set Java and look at the API and it will describe all the methods for you. But it will maintain the ordering of the doubles based on the compare to method that we went over earlier. And it will sort everything for you and keep it sorted. And then you can just iterate over this tree set and get everything in sorted order. And you don't even have to call collections.sort. It will automatically do that for you. So it is a very powerful tool. So one thing you could use these tree structures to implement is something called a priority queue. So a priority queue. Now all a priority queue is is just a queue, but there are some there is some priority among the people. So if you have this queue at your at your um, theme park, maybe someone comes in to get in line. Someone comes in. These are just regular people. And then maybe some VIP comes in, and he he was added after these guys, but he he has a lot more priority. So they're going to move him to the front of the line. He's like the president or something coming to visit a theme park. Obviously, he's not going to have to wait in line, whereas these other people are. So you can imagine there are these cases where uh, people have different priority. And then maybe, maybe there's uh, some guy that got in for free that is just testing the ride or something. And he's going to be put in after all these guys. So then when we go to add... Um, let me add some room here. So this guy has really low priority. And then when some other red person comes in, he'll just get s stuck in front of this this guy. And yeah, so the these different people have different priorities. Okay, and so that's all the priority queue is. It's not necessarily first in first out. It's just the person with the most priority is the next one out in the entire list. So with our trees, we can they're, they're sorted. So we can go get that maximum priority person or minimum priority, depending on how you want to do your priority queue, in logarithmic time. Because it, we can just go all the way left or all the way right in our tree to find that minimum or maximum priority person. So that's how you would use a tree to implement a priority queue. So you can imagine some other examples where you maybe you have a queue for a printer. You you don't necessarily want it to be the first thing that comes in is what gets printed because what if someone has to print a thousand page book and then some other student has to print just a quick two page paper? You should probably let the student print first, right? So maybe it's a minimum uh, a min priority queue and 
the it's ordered by the number of pages. So then the two-page report gets printed before the thousand-page book because the thousand-page book is obviously going to take a really long time. So of course there 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 may be some problems with that. Maybe the book if this printer is really busy, then the book just never gets printed. So that's that's something that you might have to deal with if you're developing a system like that but you can see how priority queues would be useful to have some sort of priority rather than just the first person into the queue is the first person out of the queue okay so like everything Java already has this implemented for you so it's just another class the priority queue, priority queue class Priority queue. And it has a generic type. So I'll, I'll just make it of the string type. So priority queue of strings. So I'll just call it PQ equals new priority queue. So that's all you have to do to create a priority queue. And then the important methods for this are pq.add, maybe some string. So we added the string foo. Maybe we, now we add um, apple. So obviously apple comes before foo in the alphabet. So apple, so when we do pq dot remove, apple is what gets returned. Apple is what gets returned here because our priority queue is going to maintain the ordering based on the compare to method and return. Uh, by default, it's the minimum element. So the smallest element um, is what gets returned by default. Because uh, most things are uh, by default in ascending order. So the smallest thing is what would get returned or it would be sorted in ascending order. You have to do some special stuff like I showed you with the compare to method if you want a descending order or some other weird ordering for example. And so similar to the sorting, uh, the sorting um, method from collections, you can create this priority queue object, this priority queue, and you can give it some more parameters. So it, you, you have to, if you want to give it a comparator to compare these strings in some different way, then you have to uh, also give the priority queue an initial size. So that's just some something in Java, it's not really necessary. You don't need to worry about what size you make it, but 11 works. So then you can also pass in a comparator. New comparator. So a new comparator of strings, and then we have to implement this compare to method again or compare method rather public and compare and then string this string that so now we have this compare method and let's say instead of sorting by sorting them alphabetically, we want to sort them by their length. So we want the shortest string first. So the way we could do that is just return this dot length. Length is a method that the string class has minus that dot length.
And so now we're going to have this. Um, we're going to have this priority queue of strings, but instead of using the compare to method of the the default compare to method of the string class, it will use our new comparator that we just created, and it will be ordered by least uh, least length. So, for example, if we had our priority queue. If we added A, 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 and B, B, if we added these two, even though B, B would come after A, A in the alphabet, because it's shorter, it's going to get moved up to the front and be considered to have more priority because that's what we defined our compare to method or our, our compare method to do. That's what this is right here. So, that's what a priority queue basically does, and that's how you instantiate it and how you can sort of mess with the ordering of it. Okay. So, some uses for a priority queue. One just really basic one, which isn't really necessary since we have our own sort method, but you could just add all a bunch of elements to your priority queue and then remove them all and get them in sorted order. So that's that's called generally called heap sort because um, I'll write that down. Heap sort. Because priority queues are usually implemented using a heap. Now, I'm not going to go over that, but uh, feel free to look up heap. It's a useful structure. It's not very difficult to code. Um, okay, so that's how they're implemented. So you can use priority queues to sort. They are also useful. Imagine you have in a graph theory problem called Dijkstra's algorithm, which I believe we will get to later in these lectures. Dijkstra, that's how it's spelled. Um, you, you have to use the priority queue in Dijkstra. And th basically the problem that this solves is the shortest path between two, two vertices in a graph. So imagine you're in Atlanta, and then New York is up here. And you want to find the shortest road, the roads that get you to from Atlanta to New York. So some, some roads might have different, weight, different uh, weights, like a highway might, you can drive much faster on a highway rather than some back road. So you obviously want to try to prefer the highway as much as possible, even if the highway is slightly longer than taking the back roads. For example, traveling 100 miles on a highway may be much quicker than traveling 75 miles on the back roads. So their actual distance might be different. And so you can imagine the priority queue lets you decide what the priority is and helps you choose the best path. So that's just one application of the priority queue in Dijkstra's algorithm. OK. So that's priority queues and sorting and all that good stuff. So the next topic I'm going to cover is hash tables. Hash tables and hashing. OK. So hash tables are a very nice structure. table. So a hash table is basically, you can think about it as an array. You have an array and you want to put some objects in it. So these are our indices. Zero, one, two, three, four, and five. 
So with the hash table, maybe maybe we want to put some people's names or maybe we want to put some phone numbers in there. Let's come up with some phone numbers. So seven seven oh one two three four five six seven. Then uh, let's say four oh four two three 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 three. Okay, and maybe six seven eight zero 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 one 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 one. Just some random telephone numbers. So now we want to put these in our hash table in some way. So how we're going to do that is we're going to use something called a hash function and a compression function. So a, there are two steps. The hash function and the compression function. So this is one and this is two. So what the hash function does is it will take in an object, each object has this method called hash code and it's basically going to map that object to an integer value. So it will take in this phone number and map it to some particular integer value. So let's just make a basic hash function, it can really be anything, and we'll say our hash function is going to be the sum the sum of the digits and we'll just say in the area code. So it'd be like the sum of these first three digits. Right? So here, let's write out the hash functions. So when we hash this, we just get 7 plus 7 plus 0, 14. When we get this, we get 4 plus 4, 8. When we get this, it's going to be 21. Yeah. Just add up 6, 7, and 8. And so these are all of our hash values for these entire phone numbers. Okay. So now you can sort of think of these as the indices we want to try to, sorry, not yet. These are just unique, not necessarily unique, but they're values that these phone numbers map to. Now with our compression function, we want to try to get an index we can put these phone numbers at from these hashed values. So our compression function, if this is our table right here then generally the compression function we're just going to mod by the table length. So here uh, length length equals six, right? Because it's zero index, so there are six spots in our table. So now when we compress these we're just going to do mod 6. So mod, all that mod is is basically if you take 14 and divide it by 6, what is the remainder? So 14 divided by 6 is going to be 2. Um, sorry, the remainder is going to be 2. It is also 2. 2 point something. So now, oh, this is a bad example. We're going to change this area code to 405. So now 9 mod 6 is equal to 3. And 21 mod 6, let's make this 9. Uh, Better. And now we have our indices. So we hash we hash the telephone number 
So 14, 9, and 22. And then we compress it using this mod function. And then this gives us our indices. So we basically just mapped all of these objects to indices. As you can see, they're not necessarily unique. Um, there, it is possible for there to be collisions. But in general, if we have a good hash function, we would like to believe that most of the time they will be unique. So here, let's just, I don't want to write out the whole telephone number, so we'll call them A, B, and C. We, we would take A and put it at index 2. We would take B and put it at index 3. And we would take C and put it at index 4. Okay, so that's how that would work in our hash table. We use using any hash function, and the hash function you can just come up with it on your own. As you can see, adding up the digits of the area code is pretty random. Um, as long as it's consistent with the input, so if I get this number again, I will always return the same hash function, it's okay. And then we use our compression function to get the index, and then we put them into the hash table at that location. So I'll go over quickly one way to deal with collisions. So let's let's make some other telephone number up. I don't know. 405, 405, and a 404 will work. And then just 111, whatever. Just some telephone number. So we'll call this one D. So when we hash it, well, what are we going to get? We're going to get 4 plus 4 equals 8. And we're going to compress it. So we're going to get 2 as our index. So we already have something at index 2. So how, how can we handle that? We don't want to get rid of A because these are two entirely different objects. So th this linked list class that we saw earlier, where we just have it point to the next object, will come in handy. So we can treat each of these indices as entire linked lists. So the, these three right here are just empty, and these three have size 1 with one node in them. So here, we'll just add D to the linked list. And so that's a nice way of handling collisions, and then hopefully these linked lists don't get too long, and we will have very quick running time because we can look up directly what index these elements should be at inside of the hash table. So hope we would like to have O of 1 uh, lookup time, constant lookup time for a specific element, which is very nice. So, yeah, because all we're doing is a hash function, which is constant time, a compression function, which is constant time, and then indexing an array, which is constant time. The only possible way for it to be uh, more slower is if we have a bunch of collisions and have some big linked list that we have to search through. Because remember, the running time of a linked list is dependent on the length of that linked list. So hash tables are generally very quick. It's one of the most important structures that you need to know. It, they're, they're used all the time, everywhere. Um, you see them in job interviews, in industry. It's a very good structure to know how to use. They come up all the time in uh, programming problems. Um, they, they're very nice for creating something like a visited list, saying, have I already seen this before? Well, if you throw them all into like a hash set, then you can, in constant time, go look up and say, hey, have I, have I already seen this before? Is this in my visited list, or visited hash set, whatever you want to call it, and check to see if you have seen something or if you should move to that particular state. So they're, they're very, very nice.
So like everything else, these have also already been implemented in Java for you. And the Java one is very powerful and it handles collisions uh, it, it handles collisions for you. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about how you have to deal with that. So let's just say I have a hash set. So this is similar to the tree set in that it doesn't allow duplicates. And this will contain strings. So this is, a, we'll call it visited. Or, yeah, sure, visited. So that's how you create a hash set in Java. So let's pretend like we playing like the alphabet game or something where you start with A and someone has to say a fruit or something that starts with letter A, B, banana, etc. So all the way down to Z. And when you get to Z, you have to keep uh, coming up with new letters, or, sorry, I mean, new letters starting back at A, and you just keep looping. So, you, the let's say the twist on the game is you can't say something that someone else has already said. So, in our game, if we wanted to implement it in like a program to check to see if someone has said something, we could have our visited list, and as someone says a word, we would just add it to our visited list. So, let's say we have some list of strings. So this game has already been played and these are all the words that have been said and we want to check to see if someone has said a, said a duplicate word that has already been said. So these are our words equals so we, we got that from somewhere. Now let's let's just make this a, a method. So we'll call it check. And it will return a boolean whether the game is valid or so true if the game is valid, false otherwise. So you have your list of words, and that's all you need to check if it's valid. We just want to make sure there's no duplicates in here. So the first thing we do is create our hash set. Hash set of strings. And I'll just abbreviate it V for visited. Equals new hash set string. So I create my hash set, and this is going to contain all the strings that are said throughout the game. So now I want to loop through this list of words. So one way to do that is some, using something called a for each loop, which um, will take advantage of the iterator class and iterate over the entire word or the entire list. So. I'm going to say for each word. So I tell I tell the for loop basically what type of object is going to be inside this iterable structure. For so this the structure contains strings, and so I need to give it a variable name so I have access to it inside of the loop. And then I do a colon, and then I give the actual variable name of the structure that I want to iterate over. So this is for each word and words. Okay? And that's what this is going to do. It's going to do this loop for me. So the first thing I want to do is check to see if I've already seen this word before. 
Because if I've already seen this word, it's a duplicate and the game is not valid. So if v dot contains word, All right? So we're gonna we're gonna check if our visited list already contains this word that someone has said. So if it does, we're going to return false because this game is not valid. There there was a duplicate. Else, if the word has not been said yet, well, we need to update our visited list so that if it's said in the future, we see that it has already been said. So all that's going to entail is adding it to the visited list. v.add word. So there we go. That's the entire method to check uh, if the game is valid or not. At the end, if we didn't see any duplicates and we got all the way through the list, we want to return true because the game is valid. There weren't any duplicates. And so this is how you could write a method, a really simple method, to check if something like the alphabet game or any list of strings has duplicates in it. And that's all there is to it. Um, so let's, let's look at the running time of this. Here, to iterate over the, all the words is going to be linear time. It's O of n, right? Because we just look at each word once, and assuming we're using a structure that makes sense for this for loop, um, as long as you're not using linked list and doing get, get at 0, get at 1, get at 2, you're going to have a nice behavior where the running time is O of n. OK? And then v dot contains word. So what this line is going to do is first it will hash the word and then it will compress the word and it will go into that index of the table within our hash set and see if that word is there or not if that index is empty and so like like we said hashing is constant time then compress excuse me compressing is constant time and then accessing an an index in an array is also constant time. So this whole step is constant time. So let me write, let me write in a different color so you can see this better. So this step right here, like I said, is O of n. This step right here is O of 1. Here, when we want to add a word, it's very similar to the contains method where we just hash compress and go to that index and just add on to the end of whatever linked list is there if there happens to be a collision. So this is also going to be O of 1. Okay, so this is our loop. So, so we're, we're doing each of these O of 1 operations n times. Right? So our total running time is going to be O of n times O of uh, 1 times 2, right? Because we do this O of 1 thing twice. So this, if you're familiar with big O, you can pretty much ignore this. We only care about this largest term. So the running time of this entire algorithm is O of n. So, and obviously you can't do better than O of n because you have to look at each word at least once to see if there's duplicates, right? Otherwise you can't be sure whether the game is valid or not. So, so this is very clear. If we were to, if we were to use a, a tree instead of a hash set, for example, this would be n log n because it would take log n time to add, to check contains and check add. So this hash set is very quick compared to every other structure pretty much. So I'll just quickly go over 
how how the hash set gets the hash code values. Uh, it's sort of important. So to get these hashed values, let, let's create our student object again. Public class student. And it has some integer ID. And let, let's also give him a name now. Name and maybe an age. So you have these three fields. Now every object in Java has this method called hash code. So it's the, the signature is public int hash code. And this is a method that is required because it is in the actual object class from which everything uh, is a subclass. So if you're familiar with the class hierarchy in Java, object, right, this is capital, is at the very top. And then you, you have like your collections over here, maybe. And then you have your, your lists, your um, your tree sets, you have, you have all, all sorts of other good stuff. And then our student object is right here. So everything is a subclass of object, and this hash code is in the object uh, class. So every, every single object in Java has this hash code method. And, and that should tell you something about how important it is this sort of uh, hash table structure if Java is requiring that every single object be able to have a hash code. So what we need to do now is take this data from our student object and create some meaningful integer, integer value that is our hash code. And so there are a few things with hash code. If you're given the same two objects, it should always generate the same hash code because it's not going to be helpful if one of the, so if we have the string, uh, let's just say foobar, and we hash it one time and we get seven. All right, so we'll be looking at index seven in our hash table. And then let's say we hash it again and we get nine. So this isn't going to be very useful because we're going to be looking for foobar at index nine and say, hey, it's not in our list, when we really did already add it at seven. So you can't just return some random integer. It, for any specific input, it always has to generate the same output. That's important. Um, and two objects that are considered equal should also generate the same hash code. So what we're going to do is we're just going to say our value, we're just going to start it off at 0. So let's do, we're going to loop over all of the characters in the name first. For int i equals 0, i less than name.length. I plus plus. So this is going to give us the index of each character uh, and name, however long that is. So now what we'll do is we'll just do value plus equals, let's just pick a random number, 13 times 
66 plus uh, name dot care at i. So this name dot care at i is going to uh, it's going to go get the character at the ith index and name and use its ASCII value which there's a chart if you just look up ASCII table on Google it'll tell you all the values of the different letters and it will take that integer ASCII value add six, it'll and then it'll add 13 times 66 to it or maybe we want to add 66 to it first it'll add 66 to it and then multiply it by 13 so this is these are just some random numbers it doesn't matter because it's always going to return the same value it doesn't matter what these numbers are of course picking better numbers are is going to give you a better hash function which will behave nicely um, compared to other hash functions and you'll get fewer collisions so that that deals with the name so we're done with this so now we also want to deal with the ID and age just to give it some more variety so now we'll just say value uh, now we're just going to multiply it by the age so value times equals age and so this times equals is just if you're not familiar with it it's just shorthand for saying value equals value times age it's just a nice little Java thing because this happens a lot so it's just shorthand for that same with the plus equals okay so now we'll multiply by the age and then let's say we'll subtract off the ID value minus equals ID and then we'll return this value so sorry we don't want to return the ID we want to return the value so that's just a basic uh, hash function that we can implement for our student object and that will let us uh, that will let us use our student object with the uh, hash hash table class and give us O of one adding access etc to that structure if we don't implement this hash code method if we just leave the default objects hash code method in there it will use the uh, actual address of the object in memory so even if you consider two students equal like they have the same ID name and age but they are two different objects in memory they won't be considered equal by the hash code method and you will have problems so you should always if you plan on using something on a hash table override the hash code method to do something relevant some, something that you expect it to do instead of just using the address of that object in memory okay so let's give an example of a hash code system I'm sure you all have been to a library and know at least what the Dewey Decimal System is but that is pretty much a, the library is pretty much a giant hash table so for example the science books they all hashed a sub number the uh, starts with 500 so like 501 507 based on the different types of science books so you know exactly what index in the library to go to to find your science books and then maybe an art book has a hash code of 700 something so if you're looking for an art book you know what index in the library you need to go to you just need to go to the 700 aisle or whatever and, and then you can find all these art books so that's a real-life example of uh, basically a system that uses hashing so yeah these are very useful structures they are they, they, they're pretty much one of the fastest structures and do everything quickly so they are good to know how to do so let's see is there anything else okay so that that's all I'm going to cover for today um, so yeah if you have any questions you can go to that website and I'll leave this on for a minute 
and you can ask me. Uh, programmingteam.cc.gottech.edu slash high school slash chat.html and other than that I'm done so you can